my name is Nicola Wilk uh, from Berlin, Germany. Uh, Francine Marquez from Melbourne, Australia is with me. We've just had a fascinating uh, session on orphan receptors and the gut microbiome. So uh, Francine is a specialist working on microbiome mediated mechanisms of hypertension. So thank you for your fascinating talk. And just to start off, so why do you think we should care about the microbiome in hypertension? No, th thank you. That's a very, very kind introduction. And um, well, th there are many reasons that we should care about the gut microbiota. Uh, it is a really important site for salt absorption, for instance, and a lot of your work uh, uh, focuses on that and has shown the importance of the microbiota in, in salt handling in hypertension. But in my research, our focus has been on uh, dietary fiber. And we have known that fiber lowers blood pressure. We have had that information for many decades. But until recently, we didn't understand how that happened. And what uh, my team and your team and uh, some other teams also have shown is that that happens by the gut microbiota. So fiber reaches our large intestine intact, where fiber is then uh, um, fermented by the gut microbiota. And as a result, we have production of uh, microbial substances called short chain fatty acids. Yes. And those then can help us lower blood pressure. So there are many different reasons that uh, we should care, one being um, even like just dietary uh, uh, risk factors for hypertension that is low fiber intake and high salt intake. The gut microbiota is really important for that. Yeah. So um, you've worked a lot on the mechanisms. So what do you think are the most prominent challenges in the field that probably, probably you're working on? Very good question. I would say that a, a key challenge is that we tend to work uh, with very complex systems. Blood pressure is really complex, the microbiota is really complex. And what our research is pointing is that there is this gut to a host communication that happens likely via production of metabolites and activation of immune cells. And immune cells that are in the gut that either can migrate from the gut to other tissues or also uh, metabolites that then can pass to systemic circulation and activate cells in systemic tissues such as the gut, uh, such, such as the kidney. So um, I think that's one of the key challenges is actually understanding this because it's so complex. Um, and another one for a lot of the work that I do looking into this uh, G protein couple receptors is antibodies. There are no reliable antibodies available for purchase for this, which makes them much harder to study. So these would be some of the two key challenges. One more technical and one just, I guess, uh, the field, yeah, as it stands at the moment. Okay. I think we should mention that we've had also a fascinating talk by Jennifer Plusnik, Absolutely, uh, who yeah. did, um, who is famous for her pioneering work on the G protein coupled receptors, olfactory receptors. So what I do value about your research is your translational approach. So could you tell us more about your translational approach? How do you approach this? these problems? I think in the end of the day, like we, we do the research we do because we want to see a benefit to uh, um, our patients in the community. Uh, and one of the things that we have done is to run a, a randomized clinical trial to see whether these gut microbial metabolites that we have shown in animal models that lower blood pressure could actually lower blood pressure participate in people with hypertension in our patients. And um, to do that, one of the approaches that we had to do, and that was very challenging, was to come up with a way to deliver consistently high levels of microbial metabolites to our uh, participants. And we did that by using a fiber that has been chemically modified and enriched by these microbial metabolites. And with the use of this new fiber, we're able to show that uh, even in two weeks, we can lower people's blood pressure to a level that is clinically relevant. Um, in some of our other studies, we also have been doing studies looking into um, gastrointestinal pH in participants with normal and high blood pressure, uh, and uh, just characterizing the microbiota uh, in uh, participants as well as the metaproteomics and some other layers that we're just starting to uh, explore. Um, and I think this is really important that we can combine the animal work with the human work because in the end of the day we want to find new ways to be able to leverage this to lower blood pressure in our participants, not just in our clients. 
Yes, of course. So I do value this approach and I think looking back over the past, let's say, five to ten years, so much has happened in the field of microbiome research. So we are in a, in a stage where we still, where we have to prove that this is worth something for our patients. So, and um, maybe to another question regarding this, so how do you value uh, the efficacy of microbiome targeting approaches compared to pharmacological approaches? Can we combine? Should we combine this and how? Yeah, yeah. I think that those are very good questions and I don't have the answers for <laughs> all of them. Um, I hope we can combine in the future. Our research particularly was done in untreated hypertensive patients. I think this is a patient group that has this unmet clinical need because a lot of them don't want to go on medication because of side effects. So if we can provide them with new uh, approaches that perhaps they don't uh, have the same side effects and they're still effective, uh, I think this is going to fulfill this huge uh, unmet clinical need. But also with participants, uh, patients with resistant hypertension, um, there could be a benefit of combining some of these microbial approaches. We, I particularly think that uh, there could be a benefit from uh, these high fiber interventions with short chain fatty acids in lowering blood pressure because one thing that we forget is that most medications used to treat uh, hypertension, they actually need an acidic um, intestine to be able to be absorbed. And, and the intestine is the major site of absorption of all of them. And as I, I showed some data today, people with hypertension have a pH in the intestine that is higher, so potentially lowering that might increase absorption and might increase perhaps, and I have no data to show that yet, but it might increase uh, uh, the efficacy of some of currently available medications. So that's, that's very interesting to hear. I, I really think that we should bring our knowledge to the patients. Do you think that every hypertensive patient profits from a my, microbiome targeting intervention or maybe we should say I mean we're talking about dietary interventions we know that adherence to dietary recommendations is rather low yep. so how could your knowledge help increase adherence yeah that, that, that's a very different questions very good points both of them I'll start with whether all patients benefit no, from our uh, trial at least, and it's a small trial at this point, we saw about a 70% uh, decrease in blood pressure. That was like a significant uh, uh, in terms of clinical reduction. Uh, so we do need to understand what makes someone a super responder. We had one participant that blood pressure dropped by 20 millimeters mercury. So what makes that person a super responder and how we make everybody else a super responder too? And um, we have looked into traditional risk factors for hypertension and they don't seem to explain it. So perhaps one way to look at it is what is the baseline microbiota? Are they able to handle fiber or perhaps handle salt better than someone else? So there's still a lot of research to be done in this area for us to identify this personalized approach to dietary interventions or microbiota interventions. The second issue is that uh, people being able to follow long-term dietary guidelines. And it's hard. Like, I know that I, I mentioned in my talk that, like, for example, for women, the recommendations in Australia, 25 grams of fiber a day. I don't get to eat that. Um, so if most people would actually try to write down what they eat, they would realize that even we are all very um, like aware of diet and the importance for cardiovascular health. Most of us in this conference is still not achieving dietary guidelines for fiber intake, and I'm not even going to go on sodium. So the major issues about um, education, that people just don't understand where they can find the types of food that uh, we're telling them that they need to eat. Um, and there's also issues then about being able to afford that. And long-term maintenance is really complicated. So that's why I think there is another unmet clinical need for us to develop new ways to help patients to achieve either through supplementation or uh, uh, other ways that we can try to boost their fiber intake or um, it directly their uh, metabolite intake. Um, regarding the mechanisms, um, we're talking, we were talking about patients, um, but there is a need 
um, to identify mechanisms. However, the value of animal models is being questioned now, uh, questioned nowadays. So, how, where do you see the value of uh, animal research in your field? Yeah, our lab does both animal and clinical research, and I cannot see how we could pinpoint mechanisms without combining both. Um, I really think that that's something that is really essential that we really need to be looking uh, on both ways and it's like the translational but also the reverse translational approach of what we found in the patients and what does actually mean because there's so many interventions that we still can't for many different reasons to do in uh, patients and we can explore that easily in animal models to show different mechanisms and then revert that back to patients. And that's how we started in the field looking into short-chain fatty acid production by uh, the microbiota, the fiber intake, the dead load, blood pressure in animal models, in now several animal models. And now, five years later, we have been able to publish the first clinical trial. So it's, it's a huge need to do both research and then uh, be able to combine them. And looking into mechanisms in particular, considering how uh, complex blood pressure regulation is, there are many different organs that we can't find the answers just looking into human samples. So we need to still do the animal work, in my opinion. So once again, thank you very much for your fascinating talk today. I am curious about your research in the future. I thank you for your attention and welcome to this year's hypertension meeting.